It's been a terrible week in Dublin with the shocking stabbing of three children and a school care assistant outside a primary school, followed by rioting and violence across the city. 34 arrests were made, several Garda officers were injured in the riots, and uh, the Commissioner Drew Harris said, and this is a quote, people have been radicalised through social media and the internet. So was that the cause of the violence and did the reporting of the incident worsen the situation? So here to discuss this, I'm joined by journalist and broadcaster Ella Whelan. Thank you for coming, Ella. So firstly, I suppose we should address why this has happened. What are the origins? What are the tensions here? Well, the idea that it's simply an organised far-right outburst um, is a total misunderstanding of the complexity of what's been going on. Yeah. Anyone who looks at what these uh, people did in that evening, looting, footlocker, setting things on fire, as Cresta said at the beginning of the show, you know, a lot of it is just uh, idiot behaviour. That's opportunism. You know, it's, yeah, it's the kind of thing, you know, the kind of thing that happened in the London riots um, in, you know, a few years back here where, you know, people take an opportunity and they do stupid things and there's not necessarily anything too uh, dramatically political about that. But but there is something that happened and and... It, there's a kind of a, melt, a, a boiling sort of pot thing going on here, which is that the way in which the incident was reported um, of the two little girls being stabbed and the care worker and the whole thing that happened, um, the Irish media, the Irish Times leapt on the uh, opportunity to say this was somebody who was a naturalised citizen, he'd been here for 20 years, you know, there was almost, you could almost feel the sort of tension in the Irish media elite saying, don't go there on the immigrant question. Don't yes. go there, even though Dublin is a small town, <laughs> even though it's a city, and uh, word had spread that what this person looked like. And so there, there quite quickly became this sort of tension of they're not telling us the truth. Right. They're not, they are, they're, they're lying. You know, they're going to spin this a certain way. Um, and I think that has been a large part of what fed into the outburst of anger. There's also the case that, you know, uh, Dublin uh, has had a lot of problems. Well, the whole of Ireland has, but in particular Dublin with housing um, and, you know, a whether you want to call them the left behind, the sort of working class, whatever it is, there's a you know, section of people still living in Dublin and on the outskirts who are extremely so destitute, extremely poor, and extremely ticked off with the sort of Dublin four set, yeah. um, pretending like nothing is, nothing is wrong. There's real tensions yeah. um, in that city. And that has also fed into it sort of spilling out. So it's a complicated thing to try and assess. And, the, and for me anyway, I think it's telling that the Irish media has um, got more het up about a, its imagination of a far-right attack yes. than it has the stabbing of two children. Well, there's two things, isn't it? I mean, firstly, the, the, going on a, a riot and setting things on fire, that's not a sensible response to anything, and that yeah. should be said. Um, but also, if the media and the police are going to be smearing the entire group of people as far right. Won't that heighten resentment? Yeah, it will. And I mean, uh, Brendan O'Neill wrote for Spiked um, a few days ago talking about the fact that these people were called lunatics, you know, so, which is, you know, it might have been just a throwaway word by the Guardi, but I don't think it was. It was a kind of, you know, these, you have to be sort of mentally ill to not go along with the official line yes. of, and it has been nauseating actually listening to, um, in particular, British uh, media coverage of what, Irish, you know, getting all these people from disinformation units in Ireland, academics or yes. Alia Varadkar also sort of defining this as sort of A, saying it's us and them. In fact, actually, Fintan O'Toole wrote an article over the weekend saying, Irish commentator saying, there's the us who are, we love immigrants. There's no problem. We're a nation of immigrant lovers and and don't just don't talk about it and then there's them these awful oiks who hate immigrants and again i mean you wish that they'd get outside of the yeah. um the little area in dublin and know that actually there are some tensions in relation to immigration and know they're not not everybody's not far right but there are there have been incidents in ireland in which the discussion about immigration has been much like it has here just totally clamped down on there seems to be a mirroring that, here i mean there's a lot th this idea of an, an elite political class who are completely out of touch with what's actually going on Mm. And they're just projecting this idea of how they would like things to be. Yeah. Well, to take a very small example, um, you know, that in a town where my parents live um, called Bolton Us, there was a, you know, a sports hall that was meant to be being built. Planning permission takes a million years. In Ireland, it was a big rigmarole. And, you know, for a small community, it was going to be a great resource. And, um, uh, you know, after the war was in Ukraine happened, Almost overnight, it was turned over to housing for Ukrainian refugees. Now, you can have an argument about whether or not you provide housing for Ukrainian refugees. And I'm sure lots of people, would, you know, particularly in Ireland, be, they, well, they were quite liberal about that. Yeah. 
But you don't just get to undemocratically and unfairly snatch a resource from a community that had, you know, was invested in it. And that kind of thing keeps happening. Yes. And it causes tensions in people who are not anti-immigrant, not, they're not sort of what the Irish media paint them as sort of foaming at the mouth far right types. They're people who want to have some kind of sense of fairness and a nuanced discussion about immigration. The problem is the more that this gets pushed underground, the nastier it will get. And there is a problem with anti-immigrant sentiment in certain parts of Ireland. And there are far right people who would take an opportunity. And I think that those of us who are on the left or, you know, liberal on immigration need to take this very seriously yeah. and not let the sort of Dublin Four set set the agenda on discussions about immigration. I mean, one of the things that's really worrying is that this is pretty much given the Irish political elite the green light for an incredible bill around hate speech which is one of the, I mean, really, it's one of the worst. Well, we've covered it quite a lot on this show because they are really pushing this through. Mm -hmm. And it does seem incredibly draconian. Almost, I, I, I'd say it's probably worse than Scotland's yeah. uh, hate speech bill. And it will be weaponized. I mean, they haven't, they, didn't the Irish government even say that they couldn't really define hatred? No, yeah. They, they defined it in circular terms. Mm -hmm. Hatred yeah. is hatred. A hatred is anything that inspires hatred. Is great. Sort of, yeah. well, that's, that, great. I'm glad that's on the statute but books, nice and clear. In a very kind of Irish way as well, the way in which they've discussed the bill is by saying, they have a little line where they say, you can be offensive, which is, which is you know, Irish people have to double doublespeak, which is, you can't be offensive, because the next line says, but anything that could possibly incite hate incite hate, not incite violence, incite action, incite, you know, but incite hate, this nebulous term, yes. will be outlawed. So you absolutely can't be offensive because <laughs> most people don't like, feel hatred towards things that are offensive. Yes. So you end up in just this horrendous sort of quasi-intellectual soup of words that actually really means that the there is going to be no free speech in Ireland, political or otherwise. Yes. And the thing that you just get so depressed about is that this won't have the outcome of a lovely country which is sort of tensionless and everybody gets along. It will do the exact opposite. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, you've spoken many times about censorship and the history of censorship. And we know that if you do this, if you try and clamp down on people's right to free speech, bad ideas do not disappear. No, they just, well, no, they don't disappear, but also they, you lose people who have a sense of principle on an issue, mm. which is that you, you know, if you are, take the issue of immigration, if you are liberal about it and you think that you want to have a sort of nuanced discussion about it and you have a load of people who might disagree with you, but who are saying, we are just not allowed to talk about this. We keep getting called racist. We yes. keep getting called, all the nuance gets lost and you end up, it ends up with an us and them mentality, um, which the Fintano tools of this world are very comfortable with because they like to look down their nose at people. But the rest of you know, normal citizens who can see that having a concern about immigration does not make you a sort of Tommy Robinson type. Yes. Um, I think they just lose all hope of any kind of nuanced outcome for the discussion. But is it partly that the commentariat and the type of commentators that you're describing there, they feel very comfortable with this because they know that their opinions, their, their set of values are currently on the same side as the Irish government and as what's considered the right opinions to have the Overton window, I suppose. Whereas you know, how, that, how can they not be sure that this is laying a precedent for censorship of their own opinions late, later down the line? Well, they're just, I mean, it's all tied up in a very neat, neat bow in Ireland. I mean, if you take a different issue, um, discussion about uh, gender ideology and trans gestures with the teacher, Enoch Burke, I think his name was, who was eventually ended up in jail for um, a long saga of refusing to use different pronouns for a child in a school that he taught religious school that he taught. Right. Um, and uh, the, you know, there was such a clamp down of the way in which it was discussed in an RTE um, in Ireland, so much so that a one radio show that were kind of had a really nuanced open discussion about this was immediately petitioned and supported, politicians support the petition to be taken off air. So right. there just is such an, uh, maybe it's to do with the, um, maybe it's to do with the fact that the kind of history of Ireland and the way in which sort of social social tensions work there, that they're a completely new sort of religious oppression, which you've written about in the New Puritans. Uh, Ireland is such a great example of that, of sort of don't rock the boat mentality, a kind of keep your mouth shut mentality within the political elite has just allowed a really repressive uh, cultural attitude to kind of prevail. And uh, But the important thing to know that is that normal people are, aren't going along with it. And there's a lot of bubbling tension and it could go one of two ways. It could go in a kind of pro, you hope, and I think we should push for it to go in a sort of pro-free speech, um, pro-freedom, pro-democracy open debate way. But if there's too much clampdown, then it could go to quite dark territory. Ella Whelan, thank you very much for joining me.